Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I'm in Glasgow at the moment. Um, I'm speaking to you from my home, which is a beautiful two-bedroom apartment, which is fully gas centrally heated in a very desirable area called Kelvin Bridge in the city centre, close to lots of local amenities, including the subway at Kelvin Bridge Station, just 10 minutes to the city centre. Um, on what is actually a very snowy evening here in Scotland, as I'm sure it might also be down there where you are. But I was really excited about the prospect of taking part in this, specifically because of the remote nature of this transmission. I like the idea of being able to do something or to communicate with you without having the rigmarole of travelling by train all the way down to London. I seem to spend a lot of time travelling on the train. Uh, you know the story with the advance purchase tickets and zero flexibility, the delays, the cancellations, and of course we all know what effect this snow is having on that as well. So it was fantastic to be able to do this from the comfort of my own home. So I'm here, um, sat in front of my computer like I do most of my most of the time anyway. This is my completely my natural habitat. I've even got my slippers on still here. And I actually use Skype a lot. So I'm quite familiar with this environment talking to my computer screen. I actually have quite an intimate relationship with Skype that I've developed over the last year as a result of having um, what can only be described as a five month long distance love affair with a person over the other side of the world. Um, and this ended, this concluded this love affair in an ultimate compromise of my ethical principles where I ended up purchasing a flight to Australia um, against my boycott of long haul flights in order to meet this person in the flesh. But that is another story altogether, I'm afraid, unfortunately. This isn't a transmission about love, it's more of a transmission about ethical compromise and contradiction. I'm interested in exploring with you um, some ideas about whether there are points in our lives when we become less radical and more prudential, or whether there are points in our lives when we just act more impulsively and less rationally. Whether there are points in our lives where we abandon our principles altogether for the sake of our careers. So I just want to show you my first thing here, which is a, a little game that I've just acquired from eBay, the game of careers. Um, this is from 1957, where you get to play out your dream, well, to see whether you can make it as a successful career person in lots of different fields over the course of an evening. But I was interested in what Parker Brothers, who were the publishers of this game in America, have to say about the game, the board game, as a format. And they say that games should be for the player's enjoyment and not to emphasise morals and values. So I'm interested in that in terms of a career, but this is actually, this transmission is about real life rather than games, so I need to come back to what I'm doing here in Glasgow and tell you a bit about my real life. Um, you've probably realised by now that I'm not really an authentic Glaswegian. I haven't quite adopted the accent yet. Um, I'm working on it. I won't do an impression. But I did move here in two, over two years ago in 2008 when I was 29 years old and six months later in the spring of 2009 I turned 30. It was also the same time where we had um, the anniversary of this lovely lady who might recognise, Margaret Thatcher, the 30th anniversary of her coming to power in the UK. So I became kind of fascinated in this 30-year period, especially in terms of the, the changes and the developments in our society that occurred over that period, 
but also in terms of my 30th year and this this kind of this 30th year is a pivotal point in a person's life um, and my mum likes to remind me quite often that 30 is a very difficult age she remembers it well it's a point where there's a lot of uncertainty about where you're going apparently I think it was someone like Winston Churchill, it might have been Winston Churchill, who, who, who had this rather nice quote about how 30 can really be this pivotal point when a person reassesses their motivations um, and decides what's really important to them. So it wasn't much of, well, maybe it was a coincidence, but it just happened that it was in my 30th year, the summer of 2009 that I managed to fulfil one of the aims, um, one of Thatcher's aims of creating a nation of homeowners by purchasing this um, beautiful apartment that I'm now residing in. And obviously when that purchase took place, I uh, made the transition from tenant to landlady and what can only be seen as a, as, a, as a turning to the dark side, which I'm still trying to come to. I became fearful that the transition into one of the property classes would sort of slowly wither away and, 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 away and my principles and cause further compromise. But look my lodger, Oliver, um, but there's definitely this hierarchical relationship between the two of us, the landlady and the lodger. Um, but I don't feel too bad about it because he is six years younger than me and he's also just starting out in a career. A career as an artist, which I, I feel that like I've been slogging away at for years. And he also knows that he's getting a good deal here with the rent that I'm looking out for him. Um, but I wanted to have this sort of, I, this continual reminder of the evil capitalist that I've become. So I asked Oliver to play a little game with me, a special game between a landlady and a tenant. Um, so every month he pays me the rent. That's the way it normally works in this game. Um, by direct debit, via internet banking. And what I asked him to do is rather than leave a reference number in the internet banking. I asked him to, to leave me a subliminal message which would then turn up on my on my bank statement. So the first of these subliminal messages has just arrived. I've got a printout of my bank statement here. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see this. Oh braid. Let's just go a bit closer. So if you can read that, I mean, it was a bit curious when I found this message on my bank statement. Um, slight sort of case of um, Stockholm Syndrome, maybe, um, where this kind of um, underlying brown nosing or looking up to the person who's actually um, repressing or... or, or or being or treating badly but also uh, he has a tendency to, to rely on tech tactics of positive psychology so I was kind of curious about that but I'm looking forward to the next one which will come up next month um, but of course this transaction this changing hands between somebody who's less wealthy and somebody who's more wealthy is a kind of the very foundations of our capital society. This is something that's happening all around the world all the time with little thought. But what I wanted to talk about now was that there was a, a point in history where it looked like um, this transaction, this type of capitalist transaction, might have been not so acceptable in a place called Scotland. There's a little known story that in 1919 
there was almost a revolution in Glasgow. Um, just one year after the Russian Revolution, there was a huge series of strikes um, in the city of Glasgow. And there was a point when 60,000 workers descended on George Square. This is a, the front cover of a book about that era. Um, and there was a real potential that this could have been a revolutionary moment. The only problem was that they didn't quite realise the power that they had in their hands. And rather than keep up the pressure and revolt, unfortunately it was Saturday afternoon and they all went to the football instead. So it was only in um, hindsight that we realised that this could have been a point in history where UK politics completely transformed and where we could have had a People's Republic of Scotland um, which would have separated us off from you down there in England and a situation a bit like what's happening in Korea now could have unfolded. Um, but, but of course going back to this this 30 year period that we were looking at um, the relationship between England and Scotland has changed a huge amount in that time and we are now a devolved country. We have our own parliament um, and even though I've been here for over two years, I've not quite fathomed exactly how it works. I've got this little booklet and I hope it's going to help me and I'll read it after I finish speaking to you. Um, but as far as I can work out, we're fairly autonomous in terms of um, deciding our policy, in terms of deciding our culture policy, our education policy, our health policy. Um, there's one thing that I do know for sure, and that is that I don't have to pay to go to the dentist. And my dentist uh, is actually just across the road in the same street that I live in. And my dentist very kindly sent me a text message this morning, which I just thought I'd show you, reminding me that it was time for my free checkup. So I'm going to give them a call tomorrow and book my appointment. Um, so. We do have our own policies. We're completely autonomous in terms of a lot of things uh, and deciding how things are managed in Scotland, even though our budgets are still managed by Whitehall. But I've been thinking about devolutionary politics a lot, and I've been thinking also about the, the contradictions that seem to be at the core of it all. Because if you look at um, Europe, a map of Europe, for example, um, it's amazing to, 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 to kind of think about how this map has transformed over the last 30 years and how the number of countries um, that there are has, has multiplied rapidly over this period. So we've gone from something like 35 countries in the 70s, and I've tried to get the exact number for this in Wikipedia, it's very difficult, but it now says there's, a, there's at least 48 countries in Europe, and that doesn't even include England, Scotland and Wales, because they still come under the banner of the United Kingdom. So we've got this kind of multiplying of countries where um, administrations are kind of becoming smaller and smaller and managing different um, ethnic groups with different beliefs. But at the same time, we've got this kind of urge towards these co massive conglomerations, these, these super states like the European Union. Um, so it just seems that we're trying to have the best of both worlds. We're trying to be really, really insignificant and small um, with small administrations whilst also becoming these completely unwieldy big um, united forces. So this kind of devolutionary, these contradictions also seem to be pretty apparent in what we call the post-British age, which has um, resulted from devolution. And I've been speaking to a lot of 
railway experts over the last couple of years as my involvement in the, the Bring Back British Rail campaign has led me to meet these interesting people. But one of the points that was made to me, which I thought was fascinating, was the idea that um, in 1993, when John Major finally pushed through the policy of fracturing and breaking up our nation's railway and dividing it into 17 different franchises, um, that not only did this, uh, well, this, this, this fracturing of, of, of the network actually paved the way for devolution in many ways. Um, and it was later in the 90s, in 1998, that we had the enactment of the, the Scottish and Welsh parliaments. So it wasn't just that these were physical links between the different regions of the British Isles, but they were, they were also um, important conceptual links. And I really like that idea. But Bring Back British Rail, the campaign, is not about patriotism at all. It's not even a, well, it's not about nationalism. It's not about any of those things. Um, it's about the, um, it's a symbolic point of resistance against the continual depletion and privatization of public services, which we're seeing, um, well, well, obviously, uh, being accelerated at the moment in, in the vicious government that's in the... Yeah? Sorry. Sorry about that. Hi. Oh, oh my God. I'll come in. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's all right. Come in. What, what do you want? I just need to... I just want oh. some money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's all right. Um, sorry, I've got to go because... um. Yeah, I've just got to do a little a little deal with. Oh, this is Oliver, by the way. This is Oliver. Uh, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, yeah, he, he he owes me some some cash. Um, should we go and have some dinner? Is yeah, that's good. Good. We've got to go and have some dinner, but it's nice talking to you. And um, enjoy the rest of the evening.